I call this story Two Bullets. Um, I had taken a lot of the money that I had made uh, from, from the dope and I had bought a recording studio. I slowly put together a studio and it ended up uh, eventually at a location on Polk and Sutter uh, in a place we called Third Floor Productions. And on the side, I was still selling dope uh, because, you know, it was good money. And once you get used to that kind of lifestyle, um, you know, you don't, you don't really change. And, and you kind of become a different person in a way because you, you hiding it from certain people and, and you got like a second life. Um, and I was the kind of guy that was really trying to move weight. I wasn't trying to break it up into small pieces and, uh, I was trying to keep it to uh, a select group of people that would buy a unit or two units, at the very least a quarter pound at a time, because uh, I had been taught uh, by some of my associates that uh, you know you cut down on your foot traffic, you cut down the risk of a ripoff or a bust. And uh, early on, uh, one of them was an actual Humboldt County Sheriff, and he was part of I'm not going to say a gang, but there was a a group of us and he, he helped facilitate the movement of this marijuana and also facilitated uh, storing it. Uh, and he taught me a few things like uh, cut your fucking hair, get rid of that flashy Scirocco, uh, get rid of the gold gaudy hums, what are you doing with a radar detector? He taught me that, uh, you know, stay in the middle lane. Uh, don't have empty fast food wrappers in your car because they pull you over and they see that kind of shit They may think you holding contraband because You know, you don't want to leave your car and it's actually true because if you got 10 or 15 20 pounds of dope in your car You're unlikely to fucking leave it. I don't care where you are um, So back to my story um, every dope guy Sooner or later runs into a situation that's fucking dicey and it's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. Like if you, if you were to look at Netflix and start watching and even some of these top mafia dudes, they all fucking go to jail or get killed or popped or whatever. Every single fucking one of them. So it's, it's, it's gonna happen. And you take a lot of steps to not let that happen, but you're gonna slip up because you can't always be on top. And in this particular case, uh, I was uh, working with a lot of different uh, rap cats from different, different hoods in San Francisco, uh, from uh, Sunnydale to Hunters Point to the Fillmore. Um, and my studio was kind of a, a hot spot for uh, different hoods to come together. And they were always beefing about something, but at uh, my studio, they would come across one another and and everything was generally pretty cool uh, and I got it in my head because you know I'm an opportunist uh, and it's in my nature to uh, try to monopolize on a situation like that so I knew a lot of these cats were um, you know they were in the game most of them were in powder or, or, or gambling or, 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 or hoes or they're pimps or whatever but they all like good weed all of them and uh, I had some of the best. And uh, I decided that with a few select individuals, I would try to open them up to the possibility that I could supply them with whatever they needed. And I knew it was a risky situation because after all the things I've been taught, uh, um, you know, one of them was being careful about who you sold to, of course, you know, that logic dictates that shit. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes greed overcomes you and you, you cut some corners and that you know, at a certain age you kind of feel invincible. And I had made it a, a, a long ways without, uh, well, I'm not going to say that. I had a couple of serious problems before this, but you know, you don't think it's going to happen again. And uh, this particular situation, it was, you know, a typical night for me. I was living in San Francisco uh, on McAllister and Scott in the Fillmore. And I had this penthouse uh, on top of one of the Victorians, a uh, converted, converted uh, 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 attic into a, a nice penthouse. And um, I had uh, 
a uh, couple people coming by that night. Uh, Bill Cutler, producer friend of mine. Um, uh, Andre uh, Nicotina was coming by to uh, chat, but maybe pick up a little something. But I also had an appointment with this cat. I'm gonna call him JT because I don't want to give him a name. But JT was a guy that I had been doing some music with and uh, had been taking care of a small amount of business. And uh, he was gonna come by and pick something up for me. Nothing unusual. Uh, so he comes up, you know, up the three flights of stairs and I go to the door and let him in. I go, I go to my office and I'm getting out the product and I turn around, he's got two, two, two guns on me. And he's telling me to hit the floor, motherfucker. This is, this is serious. And I, I look at him, I start laughing. I said, what the fuck is this, a skit? You know, I mean, what's what the fuck are you doing? You know, and he goes, no, I'm serious. This is a motherfucking rip off. Hit the goddamn floor. I'm going to kill you right now. And I was like, shit, okay. So I got down on the floor and I was still thinking this was a joke because I'd known this cat for a minute and, you know, I was used to having guns around and guns in the studio and I had owned my share of them. And I was thinking, I don't know, he, you know, this this don't sound like the cat I know. And uh, personally, I think he might have been on something because he started rapping at me like some black Muslim shit, like uh, the white race had given the black race AIDS and he was gonna even the score by killing me. And, but by the way, where was the dope? You know, that kind of shit. Now, I don't think it was about race at all. I think it was about, you know, coming up, you know, and taking what I had and making it his. And that's what happened. Um, I had uh, money in a safe. Um, uh, he had uh, laid me down on the floor and had handcuffed me. My, my hands were behind me and I was handcuffed. It was hard for me to manipulate. And he couldn't open the fucking safe. His hands were shaking. You know, I guess he was more nervous than I was. And uh, I said, brother, let me fucking open the safe then. And I, and I was thinking when he unhandcuffed me, maybe that would be a time for me to bust a move out of there. But with my spot, there's only one way in and one way out, and he was keeping a real close eye, and that gun was pretty damn close to me the whole time. So he unhandcuffed me, and I opened the safe, and you know, I had a couple G's in there, not nothing really to speak of, but enough to probably change his fucking life, and uh, maybe a half a pound or a pound of bud. And he grabbed that shit, and he continued this weird rant, you know, about. I don't know, shit I didn't really know nothing about. Cause look, man, I was just a guy in a studio working with gangsters and doing my thing. And I was just, I was just in it for the music. I wasn't trying to talk about black and white and this and that. I was just doing what I felt and I was feeling the rap music, you know? And um, it didn't make a lot of sense what he was saying. But what happened is uh, he got me back in the office and he, he laid me down on the floor and he put a blanket over my head and he got down right next to me because uh, I could hear, you know, he, he kneeled down next to me and he said, um, uh, we're going to keep this a secret. And I said, yeah, this is this will be between you and me. And then the next thing I know, boom, boom, you know, he shot me twice behind the left ear, point blank range. And of course, when you get shot at point blank range and you don't see it coming, you don't know what the fuck's going on. I mean, all, you, all of a sudden your body is just tripping. And uh, I had one of them weird experiences where I just, I just left my body and I was looking down on me laying under this blanket and he was standing next to me and uh, I, I, I saw my life kind of, like everything I hadn't done. <laughs> I didn't see the shit I had done. I saw the shit I hadn't done. And that surprised the fuck out of me. And I, I came right back into my body and uh, I heard him moving around in a room. I guess he was trying to pick up some fucking crumbs or something. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. But it didn't last long. And he got the fuck out. And um, I was handcuffed with my hands behind me. Uh, I got to my knees. A uh, sheet fell away and there was a big pool of blood. And uh, I was like, where did all this blood come from? And uh, my head felt funny. And uh, I thought maybe he had cold cocked me. Uh, 
because uh, like I say, you don't hear the bullet when it's that close. You just feel the effect. And what had happened is he had shot me and two bullets uh, had went into my skull. One went into my lower brain and one, my jawbone broke up and it went into little pieces in the back of my neck where it still lives. And uh, I guess I was in shock, uh, but I was alive. And uh, I, uh, I got to my feet uh, with these handcuffs and you can imagine it was a little, a little complicated. And I walked down my hallway and I, he had left the door kind of open and I leaned into the door and it opened up and I had one neighbor and I leaned up against the door and I fell into their hallway with blood coming out of my head. And they, I remember them sitting, watching television and their heads both turned as I fell down and they just fucking freaked because there was so much blood. And they went and called the uh, uh, 911 and uh, ambulance and the police and they all fucking came. On the ambulance ride over, the, uh, I don't know what, it, uh, the uh, paramedics, uh, were saying, uh, you know, holding up their fingers, saying how many fingers, you know, what's your name, what's the date, all that crap. And I was kind of answering them through a clenched jaw because one of the bullets had fucked up my jaw and I couldn't really open my mouth fully. And they, they kept saying, well, we think you've been cold cocked. And, and I'm thinking different by now. I'm thinking, no, nah, I've been shot. And they said, well, your, your, uh, your vitals are pretty even for a guy who's been shot. And I said, whatever, man. And the guy kind of lifted my ear and he saw the blood, which was actually the entrance wound. And he said, I think he was cold cocked. And I said, uh, nah, I don't think so, man. But they got me to General Hospital pretty quick and they wheeled me in. And uh, there wasn't much activity for a few minutes and finally a doctor came in and said, well, put this dude in a CT scan. And uh, they did. And all of a sudden, there was motherfuckers everywhere, like eight doctors, nurses, and one doctor says, this dude been shot, you know, and, and uh, he turns to me and this was so fucking funny. And he looks down at me and he says, have you ever been shot before? And I said, I think I was shot about 30 minutes ago, motherfucker. What do you think? You know, and he goes, well, you are still alive. And that's not an old wound or nothing like that. I said, this just happened. And he was like, all right, everybody clear out. We're going to have to operate. And, and uh, once they stabilized me, that's what they did. Um, they cut open the back of my head, uh, removed most of the bullet fragments, they left a few in, <laughs> and they said, um, you know, we're going to hold you for a few and see what happens. Uh, they said, uh, you're lucky you got, sh got shot point blank because the bullet doesn't have enough time to pick up bacteria in the air, and so that's the big uh, danger with a brain wound is uh, infection as the brain's a delicate instrument and yada 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 and uh, you know I didn't get an infection and uh, four or five days later they they, they released me um, you know word on the street was that somebody wanted to finish the job but I think that was just a bunch of hood rats talking and uh, you know I went home and uh, cleaned up the blood, I mopped it up myself, and uh, I knew my life had changed in some way, and uh, that's what really brought me to Los Angeles. I uh, always said I'd go to LA, but it took two bullets to get me there.